Um, for those who don't know me, uh, I'm Chris. I have no clue how many times I've been speaking at Tito's. Somebody should probably figure that out if they care. Um, today I'm going to talk about monitoring, open source monitoring. And when I was sitting in the back, I realized um, either me or one of my colleagues gave a very similar presentation like this, I think in 2007. Was anybody there? <laughs> the guy in the back recording was there. Yeah. <laughs> and a bunch of others. Um, so it could be that there's a couple of things you already know. Uh, I've also given pretty similar talks like this, I think last year, the keynote at the Open Source Monitoring Conference in Nuremberg, and I guess probably at some other places too. So there will be redundant topics, but if you haven't seen this, then it's new for you. Um, my background, I've been doing this open source thing for the better part of the last two decades. Um, I'm one of those people who sits at Linux conference and figures out, fuck, I've been doing this thing for 20 years. Um, and my background is operations and development. Uh, somewhere along the line, I started DevOps days, which has completely gone wrong these days. Um, you know, commercial idiot vendors, incompetent people thinking they know what they're doing. But, but fundamentally, what I'm still trying to do is helping people to deliver software better, faster, stronger. Um, I'm the chief travel trolling technical officer of one of the larger open source consultancy companies in the Benelux. Uh, in which we're um, somewhere short of 60 people in Europe with offices in Ghent, Braschat, Rotterdam, yes, we're hiring, um, Prague, Brno, and Kiev. So, and in my spare time, I also organize other conferences like, like I said before, DevOps Days and Config Management Camp and a bunch of others, which you might know me from too. So, this is, as you know me, a pretty opinionated talk about monitoring tools and what the open source <coughs> landscape currently does. And if you have some better ideas than what I've been doing, Please shout, because I love to learn from you. When I'm talking about monitoring, that's because it is a fundamental part of DevOps. Uh, if we talk about DevOps, we're talking about the four key components laid down by Damon Edwards and John Willis. It's about culture of an organization. It's about automate all the things. It's about monitoring and measurement. And if you work at Etsy, that means the church of monitoring, the church of graphs. And it's about sharing. So two key components here are monitoring and metrics and sharing, because it's open source. And this is pretty much the problem with monitoring in a lot of infrastructures. Who has monitoring in place in his infrastructure? Who's awake? Let's, let's start with who's awake first. That's less people than have monitoring in their infrastructure. What? Awake. Oh, yeah. Who's awake? Yeah. <laughs> and who has monitoring in his infrastructure? Maurice, <laughs> you're not awake, but you have monitoring in your infrastructure. <laughs> How can I even count if this is relevant? <laughs> is your monitoring in sync? Are you monitoring everything? No. Did you put in monitoring when you installed the machine, when you deployed the service, or was that something you put in place afterwards? A mix. Well, that's one of the problems with monitoring, right? You get some code, you need to put it in production, and then people say, uh, wait, wait, we need to do monitoring here. And you forget about it, because you don't have budget anymore. The project is over. So yeah, oh, 2008 it was. So yeah, monitoring. Back in 2007, 2008, we did a research paper for the Ottawa Linux Symposium, and I think it was Tom who presented here, not me. And we figured out there was a bunch of open source tools popping up. Um, Magios, Zabbix, Xenos, Hypericate, Q, Hobbit, Groundworks. We even had a vote in the community to figure out what, what tool did you like best. Um, back then, and that's seven years ago, people were mostly interested in Magios, Xenos, and Hyperic. I probably should put up that poll again and see the results today, but it's going to be completely different. 
What we figured out is this, there was a bunch of Java-based tools. Um, they were bloated. They required more memory than your application did. Um, there was a lot of stuff going on which was open core. Luckily, that's a term we don't really hear that much anymore. Basically, the open core idea was you have an open source core and all the fancy stuff, which people really want, is proprietary. So you could build something half-baked and then when you really wanted to do more, you needed to go to the upstream vendor and say, here's my money. And they could screw you like any proprietary company ever before. And there were a bunch of tools that were pretty good, but they had scalability issues. Um, tools like back in those days when you were running Zabbix with more than 100 nodes, you needed a dedicated MySQL DBA to tune it and make it scalable. Um, I think now the finger is up to 200 nodes. So it's not really an improvement. And, and if you look what the do-it-yourself boys did, what people who were actually running and building large-scale infrastructures, they were pretty much stuck on Nagios. I'll come back to what the state is today. And then somewhere June 2011, uh, John Vincent loses on Twitter. He was so frustrated with monitoring that he started tweeting out with the hashtag monitoring sucks. And if you can read it down there, um, it's not that they thought that everything about monitoring sucks, but it was a large part of it which he didn't like. Um, the way we had to set up fake configurations for nodes, the way how we were collecting stuff three or four, and in some setups we were collecting five times the same data to do both alerting and graphing and all those things, and that's still not being solved. And, and we kind of started a sub-movement for the DevOps movement, which, in my opinion, still is a sub-movement of the open source movement. So now we have a sub-movement of a sub-movement, which is called the Monitoring Sucks movement. And that's a group of people who started to build new tools, who started to leverage new technologies to improve the state of monitoring. Um, we set up a GitHub repository where we started listing all the tools we liked and all the tools we hated. And that repository started growing. We started adding new tools. So to give you a bit of background, why did we think monitoring sucks? Well, we had to manually configure a bunch of those services. I'm going to post the slides anyhow. So you can take pictures as much as you like. But if <laughs> the slides will be online, so you can read them at <laughs> much better quality. Um, we had to manually add nodes or resources to the platform. Uh, basically, that meant that when you start to do monitoring, you add five nodes, then you forget one, then you add 10 more, then you forget 20. And at the end of the month, you have about half of your infrastructure which is being monitored. Some of the tools supported hosts only. We were just doing ping checks. We didn't really look into the actual services because we didn't have time. And looking at the state and the health of the application services we're running on was pretty much never in happening. The other part was that because we also forgot to decommission host, basically when we decommission a host or a service, alerts start popping up which are never being removed. So you, you, you end up being in situations where there's 3,000 nodes being monitored and there's 500 of them being in, in, in error. Who recognizes these kind of setups? Bunch of hands. <laughs> Bunch of more hands. Hmm? What? Nothing is ever green. <laughs> hmm. Nothing is ever green. I don't agree with you. Well, not, not where I work. <laughs> not where you work. Karen, did you ever see completely green dashboards in the time you were at Inuit? Mm. Yes, you did. <laughs> I know it is possible. It's about culture. It's about not tolerating alert fatigue. It's yes. about fixing your platforms in a time which matter. It's still hard, but it's doable. So, when I'm talking about solving monitoring, I'm going to forget about a bunch of tools because they won't be able to help me. And yes, there's a fine print there if you are looking at a setup which is smaller than 100 nodes. Ah, a bunch of those tools become relevant again. But I really don't care about tools that don't have a stable ABI that don't allow me to configure stuff automatically. And I really don't like tools that focus on the GUI 
and want to build an all-in-one set where, well, only small part of the functionality really works. So, what do I want? We had a great talk about the history of Unix yesterday evening. And in, in a way, that's where we want to go back. Um, these are the results from, from a discussion we had hmm, a couple of years ago at our office. After FOSDEM, we organized a monitoring hack fest. Uh, there were people from all over the world working on monitoring tools. I'm not sure if anybody of you was in there. No, I don't think so. We had people from Spotify. We had people from um, back then Sensu. We had people from a couple of other tools at our office. And we were two days after FOSDEM discussing what do we want from a monitoring tool? How can we build a platform that really works for everybody? And we figured out that there's a bunch of components in monitoring tools we need. Um, we need a tool that is capable of collecting the data, <coughs> collecting the state of a system, collecting the metrics out of a system. We need something that takes that data and transports it somewhere. And maybe along the way also modifies it, drops the information we don't want, unifies the namespaces and, and that stuff. And then we need a tool that stores that data. And what we see is there are usually two types of data we care about. It's time series databases. What was the state of that value at such and such point in time? And actually data stores where we can keep logs and a lot of interesting data. And then the other thing we need to do is analyze that data. We need to look at those metrics. We need to figure out if this metric is good or right, or if it's too high or too low. And based on that information, we need to be able to act or alert, and we need to be able to visualize that to people who want to look at dashboards. So we started looking for those tools. And somewhere in... in October, November 2011, Ulf Manson, I'm not sure where he is now, but he was with Recorded Future back then, um, gave an Ignite talk at DevOps Days Rome. And he had all the slides drawn by his children. And he was talking about, yeah, John Vincent started talking about monitoring sucks, but I, I love monitoring again. I found a new bunch of tools that allowed me to really monitor my infrastructure. In his case, that was Sensu. But there was also a bunch of other tools popping up. And we did the hack sessions. Um, people started organizing Monitorama, which was a new kind of conference targeted really at open source monitoring tools. And we saw that people started to love monitoring again. And we started having setups where we did, on the left part, the data collection. You're not seeing this, right? Where's the pointer? On the left part, the data collection with a bunch of tools. Then we ship it with a bunch of other tools. We store it in time series databases, Graphite, that's the um, OpenTSDB. And then we do a bunch of other things. And we started building, based on open source tools, stuff that actually did what we were talking about. And then we started having this. Well, that's the more complex version. So after one of my other talks, one of the guys in the audience came up to me and said, yeah, we're using everything you just mentioned. And it still doesn't work. Because yeah, they were collecting stuff, but they were never shipping it. They were doing it everything wrong. So how does it work? So for me, there, there's a bunch of tools in there that are critical. You can swap them out, which you can replace them with other tools. Um, but there are still a bunch of open source tools I really want to use in my infrastructure. And, and the first one, who knows what the first one is? Easy. <laughs> so we're in the Netherlands, so I think Nagios is still legally allowed to be said, but in Germany it's not even allowed anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, the first one indeed is Ichinga. It's uh, a Nagios fork. Uh, it was forked in 2009. Uh, to me, Nagios is dead. That might have something to do with actually meeting Ethan and him ignoring me in a meeting. 
Um, but it is, in a way, a Europe versus US thing. Uh, the guys forked the code. There were other forks later from Nigel's because basically he. What's an open source community if you do not take back in the submissions from other people? It's a dead community. Um, it's different with the Achinga people. They have a bunch of people who contribute to patches. They are really happy to accept them. They organize great parties. I mean, I run into those guys every single conference. Might also be that they stalk me, but I see them a lot. Um, and it's something which you can easily automate. So if you talk about automation, if you talk about running a large-scale infrastructure, who's deploying this infrastructure manually? More than two nodes? No. <laughs> OK. To me, if you run a large-scale infrastructure and you're doing it manually, well, that's wrong. There's a bunch of tools out there that can help you do automated infrastructure. Um, mostly thinking about stuff like Puppet, Chef, uh, and a bunch of others. And if you map monitoring to automated deployment and configuration management, you end up having applications that are in sync. If you do something in a Puppet ecosystem, that means you have a node where you define there's a host, there's a service, you actually know that you are configuring an Apache server which is supposed to run such and such fee host, and you can tell a central database in the Puppet terminology that's stored config and an exported resource, you can export a resource somewhere, and then on the other side, you can have your monitoring platform, which is going to collect that data, and which is going to be in sync in reality. You have defined that you're monitoring and exposing such and such web server, so on the other side, you can actually query that information, and as soon as you add more nodes or you remove nodes, your monitoring system gets updated automatically. And that's, in a way, what the monitoring love is again about. It's about now we have the tools in place that allow us to automate monitoring, that allow us to put monitoring in up front, not add it in a later phase. Um, in the case of Ulf, it was also about new tooling. It was about how do I scale a setup. I now deploy two no or 300 nodes on AWS, and I can actually have monitoring in there. Even though if the nodes go up and down, my monitoring tool knows about it. So he found a way to automate monitoring and to actually have it scalable. Up till the point when if you walk with him downtown in Stockholm, you start discussing how many metrics you throw on a RabbitMQ, and if you want to have that cluster, it's also going back downhill. But then again, how many unicorns have that problem in Europe? Uh, we don't use the cloud here. Does anybody in Europe use the cloud? Who's on the cloud, public cloud? Public. Who's using the public cloud here? Do we have a public cloud here? Do we have a public cloud here? Oh, that's a really good question. AWS, whatever, DigitalOcean. Who's using it? Typical European audience, nobody. Is there right? Is it Europe? You don't do cloud. <laughs> yeah, we don't do cloud. We're smarter than that. <laughs> don't try that joke at an American conference. So, this is the fundamental part. There's a new era of tooling, and it's mostly the fact that we can automate everything that's bringing back the joy in monitoring. We don't need to go to a crappy un web interface from IBM or HP and click, click, click and figure out, hey, this thing is, is broken. We don't need to write a bunch of scripts in a crappy language which vaguely remembers Py re resembles Python and get over it. No, we, we've automated it and now we don't need to write the configuration files anymore. So that brings us to the next problem we had with a lot of those tools. People were monitoring services. They were just checking if the web server was up. They were checking if there was a page there. They were not actually checking if the end user was still capable of doing stuff. They were not 
talking to the actual application? Was that application still returning what it was supposed to? Um, if you have an application that does calculations and it was constantly returning one plus one is three, traditionally your monitoring setup with, yeah, I got something back, it's okay. But in a lot of cases, you didn't know what it was supposed to return because your developers were somewhere, I don't know. So we saw that developers writing applications were working in Scrum styles and we figured out that they were completely forgetting about monitoring. They were not exposing metrics, they were not exposing help pages. And one of the things we started doing was adding in their definition of done, well, done means it's monitored. I can actually query values from your application and not just from Apache or from GBoss or Tomcat. I know that your application is working correctly. To the point where eventually, hey, we have this issue with migrations, we need to shut the machine down, we need to move stuff to the other side, and, and people were, yeah, so how do you do this? Well, typically what we do if we move stuff from one data center is we put on the firewall, we wait till people complain, and if nobody complains, we shut it off and move to the other side. Why? Because we don't know if people are actually using it. Okay. So, you have no metrics and usability either? Nope. So that's when you start talking with the developers a bit further and say, look, we need to have metrics, we need to figure out if people are using it, and your work is not done until your outstanding user is dead. So we really need to measure all the things. We need to really measure us usage, state of the application, inside the application, every single bit. And I want to know about other deployment of an application, I want to know about the life cycle of the application, and I want to be able to map that to metrics. So when I do a deploy, I want to see a metric. When I know all those things, then I can actually easily migrate and even automate my migration, because I know that for the past 10 minutes there have been no connections to that application, so move it to the other side and nobody will notice. Still that's poor man's HA, I still prefer to build in a bit better style, but for a lot of companies that's already a lot. So how do I start doing that? That brings me back to one of the first components I need. I need to be able to collect data. And one of my favorite tools there is CollectD. CollectD is a daemon that runs on my machines. It has a zillion plugins. It talks to pretty much all the services I know. And if I need to build more functionality into, I can do it in pretty much all the languages I like. And by default, it's going to expose me a bunch of things I care about. It's going to expose me metrics on my CPU, on my memory, on my network, on the loads, on all the things you typically care about. The way I set up CollectD is that I flush all my data to another tool, Graphite. So, on top of that, I can have a bunch of developers who use libraries like the Code Hill Metrics library and a bunch of others to send their metrics there also. And what I have now is pretty much self-service dashboards. Um, this is GDash, where we're basically replacing GDash with, with Grafana these days. But this tool gives developers a fancy interface to their metrics. If a developer now has an idea about replacing it with Grafana, as I said, that's the next slide. This tool basically gives people an easy way to create a metric, create a dashboard, a graphite from any metric they care about. If it's number of people using the platform, if it's signups, if it's conversion rate, if it's the anything they can think about, they send the metric, it's really trivial, and they start building dashboards. They start building their own dashboards up to the point where they put in business value inside the coffee room where the CEO can see it. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was at a customer, they were talking about buying one of those expensive proprietary application performance monitoring tools. The vendors were in the room, they were already discussing the negotiations, already doing the pricing and terms conditions. 
when we figured out about those negotiations and we were like, why are we having this discussion? We've got everything in place. What do you mean you got everything in place? Yeah, we've got graphite, we've got Grafana. The only thing we're currently missing is the actual metrics from the developers. So a bunch of developers were in that room and it's like, wait, you've got graphite? We're already locally using Code Hill metrics library. 10 minutes after that meeting, those guys were making dashboards and we've never seen the vendors again. <laughs> All to the power of open source. And developers and operations people communicating. So Graphite has a bunch of tools. It has a really fun ecosystem. Um, there's, if you have performance issues, which unless you're working for booking, you probably won't, um, then you can rebuild your own carbon engine back in, uh, in Go, or you can use other tools or use InfluxDB or other backends. But for most of the setups, this is something that really scales well. It can be spread over multiple servers. Um, so it is really a good tool. So now one of the things I have is I have metrics. I'm doing alerting on basic services with a Chinga. I know that stuff is automated, but now I'm also having metrics and I want to be alerted when something is going wrong. And one of the typical cases where stuff goes wrong is an example I like to use is queues. A lot of application developers use queues these days. Some of them use JMix, uh, use um, this is, yeah, I will think I'm talking about queues. No, the example is not in there. Um, one of the use cases is queues, which you can read from Java applications, from JMX, but you can also use other Java metrics. One of the tools you can use there is JMX Trans, which takes all the JMX metrics from your Java application, puts them into Graphite, and the longer version of the talk has details on this. You can find the slides online. But what we do there is we write a check on the actual metric. We send the metrics from the Java engines, whether it's the queue length or the heap space or whatever, we send that to Graphite. Then on the application server itself, we define the check to go to the Graphite server and check if a value has changed over a period. Check if there's a threshold that has been changing and do that over a number of times. So what we do, for example, is we monitor the number of messages that are on a queue. I'm happy if there's only 10. I'm happy if there's 10 over the last hours, but I'm not happy if over the last hour there has been a constant growth of messages on my queue because then my queue is not working. And with these tools, I can actually do that because I have history. I can look back in time, which what a typical check on a Nagios or an Ikinga setup is not possible. I run that check, the check is run on the host, and then I export that to something like Nagios or Ikinga or whatever flavor of tooling you want to use. So what I have now is both checks on state, both checks on metrics, and I can alert on streams of data, I can alert on lack of data, but some people want to go further. Who's seen this tool? What does it look like to you? It's like uh, all tools together. It's like all tools together. Matrix, like verified and to me, this looks like distributed top. I can see a bunch of things held on my disks, React, metrics from some applications, and they're changing real time. This is Reman. Um, for, for a while, Reman was one of the up and coming tools that allowed you to do these things. Um, and, and it is a powerful tool, but I'm not liking it. One of the reasons why I don't like it is because the configuration is really in Clojure. Who knows Clojure in this room? <laughs> By name. By name. So I went to a project setting up Reman, fully puppetized, works out of the box. You get an empty page and then you start configuring it. And then the guy next to you was actually a Clojure hacker, spends two days configuring it. And then they wonder why there is no large scale adoption of the tool. I mean. Yes, you can do stuff like if on over 5% of the nodes I have this percent of package loss, you need to do something. Or if the load on all of these nodes is, then do some action. But 
closure is probably not the right tool if you want to get large scale adoption in a community. So, where's Riemann in there? Oh yeah, down here. You get metrics from all kinds of places. You get metrics from Riemann Health Plugin. You get metrics from Colleague D. You get all of those metrics. You shove them into Riemann and then you send the metrics to Carbon. That was eventually the setup we ended up having. After a couple of weeks, we pretty much just got rid of Riemann again. Um, one thing which is important if you start playing with it, don't use the Riemann Health plugin. Just use Collect D to get all the metrics there. Works much easier, works much better. Collect D also has a Riemann output. So, I still want to do stuff with my metrics. I still want to do those smart data analytics. I still want to go further. And there's a bunch of tools out there that allow you to do that. And a lot of them come from Etsy. They have Skyline, they have Oculus. Um, what these tools do is they take your metrics and they start turning them into data. They start doing predictive analytics on top of them. They start doing really difficult maths on that. Machine learning, and they start telling you, hey, there's gonna be something wrong with your platform. Or another thing you can do with those is, I have this spike in my network. Show me all the graphs that have the same spike. Because how would you do that? Click them on, all, figure out if there's something. And that's how you can figure out which component is being abusive. So we talked about alerts, we talked about metrics, and there's so much you can do with metrics, but you have log files. What do you do with your log files? Sorry? Ship them. You ship them. Where do you ship them? To a central server. To a central server. Why am I giving this talk if you already know it? Who's not shipping is who's not reading his log files? Ah. Don't have you don't have log files. How do you work without log files? <laughs> okay, no log files, fine. So yeah, log files. I think up to like six, seven years ago, log files were the place where you only went to look when stuff was going down, stuff was breaking. Um, but there's so much more in there. And indeed, stuff like syslog and rsyslog, you can ship them somewhere. So people started shipping logs somewhere. And then it was only one disk that was being flooded, rather than all the local disks. But then, these kind of things popped up. Who recognizes this? It's ugly, right? Would you use it? Nah. This is the, one of the very first GUIs on top of Logstash. This is actually Logstash web from the very first releases. Um, start to be better. This was one of the first Kibanas. Um, this is an alternative. This is Greylog. Can you see the difference? I don't. Um, so now we have our logs. We ship them centrally. We use tools like Greylog or Elsa or the Elk stack and we actually start making data interesting again. Um, if you look a bit closer at Logstash, you see that it can take pretty much anything, all kinds of logs, and I know that I've been updating this slide because it used to be such a short list and then such a short list, and now pretty much I keep using this one because otherwise it doesn't fit on the screen anymore. It can take data from anywhere, it can filter it, and it can send it anywhere. And by default, it sends it to Elasticsearch, which allows it to take that text and search in it. And now we can start building dashboards. We can take that log file and build dashboards which people care about. Um, we can, I think this is Apache as an example, um, make geographic maps of who's been connecting to where. You can count the number of errors you have. You can count everything. Another powerful part is because it's backed by Elasticsearch, 
you have an error in your log file because there's an error in the application. And up till a couple of years ago, when you had an error in an application and you saw it by accident, you were like, hey, I'm gonna grab on the server log and yes, there's the error. And you find like two occurrences. But you know you have 40 nodes and now you need to do this on 40 nodes. And that's not gonna be very funny to do. So you had this one issue and you go to the developer and he says like, yeah, well, hmm. I think I know what the problem is, but it's low priority. And you, you've got it only once in your log file, so I don't think we need to fix this by now. And you went back to the desk and you're like, okay, it's only there for once. What I do now is I take the error, I throw it into Kibana, and rather than one occurrence, I get, oh, over the past two days, you got 40,000 of these. Hmm. So now I go back to the developer and say, do you know you have 40,000 errors on this over the past two days? And he goes like, what? Oh, we need to fix this now. It's the same error. Only five years ago, I was logging onto one machine, finding it two times. And now I just log onto my distributed search platform and I find it 40,000 times. The quality of my software is going to improve. So what about that thing called application performance? What about the applications? I, I pretty much already told the answer because a lot of the people in the world go for the software as a service platforms in the cloud. But given that Europe doesn't use the cloud, we have other tools. Yes, you can do a lot with the metrics library from Code Hill, but there's a bunch of other tools that are interesting. Um, one of the tools I have sadly not spent enough time with, um, about a year and a half ago, I ran into PacketBeat. I set it up, it was awesome. And then I left my Elasticsearch cluster run for six months and I was like, hmm, outside of this space, what have we been doing with it? Not much, so I shut it down. Um, and about six months ago, I had exactly the same experience. But each time I play with it, it starts to show me a lot of interesting data about my platform. Um, it allows me to show the flow of applications through my network. It shows me which transactions are causing errors. It shows me stuff which I really care about. If a person opens a page on a browser, how many SQL results does that end up? All that kind of things. It allows me to build dashboards with, sadly, not in the most recent version, not anymore, which components talk to which other, because that needs to be ported from Kibana 3 to Kibana 4, and I still haven't seen it. But it gives you a lot of the features that you could get from the commercial vendors. Uh, Packetbeat now has been acquired by Elastic, so it's going to be part of their offering. Um, but yeah. So we talked about collecting, we talked about visualizing metrics with Kibana and stuff. Did we talk about alerting yet? No. There's parts of alerting in, in the Chinga and other tools, but really? This part here, like who to call when? Not yet. There's a bunch of new kits on the block. Um, one of the most promising ones is Flapjack. Uh, Flapjack is a project started by Lindsay Holmes, which is actually the second time he uses that name for a project, um, which is kind of a bit confusion because the first time it was also a monitoring tool. Uh, it was pretty much to what Sensu eventually started becoming, but now it's a different monitoring tool. Uh, Flapjack is pretty much a tool that allows you to figure out where to send the messages. So you're gonna take data from a bunch of input source, like Grafana, like Ichinga, and you're gonna define who needs to be alerted when. Um, there's stuff like Open Duty, which we're still looking at, but needs a lot of work to get working, which is also allowing you to do on-call schedule rotation and stuff like that. All of this because there's commercial offerings out there that are doing it better. Um, people by default go in the US to pager duty because they solve that problem. In, the, in Europe, well, if they don't change their rates for SMS sending, that's not gonna happen. The fun discussion with the guys at, at, at um, pager duty I had is it's not about the source code for them, it's about how they run the platform. Yet they're still not releasing their source as open source, which is, pity to me. 
So the alerting part is still, for most of my stacks, the default Akinja behavior. It's still, I'm sending out alerts to people based on the groups, based on the schedules we have defined. So it's still not really where we want it. There's a lot of work that can be done there. So still monitoring kind of sucks because it didn't go really in depth, but we're still collecting a lot of metrics twice because for high availability purposes, I need the same health statuses as my application does. There's no real integration. We use Corusync for that kind of stuff um, or Pacemaker and the Chinga for the same. So we still not having solved alerting. We're still not having one good place to get our data. But all the other parts are pretty good. I see, I love where monitoring is heading. There's a bunch of tools out there that could use some help, but there is also a lot of tools out there that are really solving the problems for you. Um, if I look at our infrastructure and the ones of a bunch of our customers, we know that it's Scaling, we know that it's fully automated. We have a lot less false positives than we used to have, but there's still a lot of work to be done. And I hope a bunch of you will actually help us with that work. And that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about today.